your metal heads in there. Let's pray. <clears throat> and Father, we do rejoice that we can call on you as our God and our Savior, as our physician. And I pray, Father, as we, we as a nation, as a world, go through this time that you, that your will be done. Uh, I don't know what is going on. I know that I can read the Bible and read prophecy and know that things are pointing towards your return. And I pray you will reveal that to us so we can not just be prepared, but be more active in sharing Christ with those around us, uh, more intent on sharing Jesus with those we know who are lost so they can have a chance to respond to you before it's too late. Bless this time this morning for your honor and glory. I pray you'll speak to us and encourage us and draw us to you. Pray for those who are not here, Tom and Lori. Be with them as they deal with illness and watch over them and their families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The writer of 2 Samuel ends kind of choppy. He has multiple things going on at one time, like I'm running out of scroll here. I want to make sure I get this in here. So he sticks it in, not necessarily in chronological order. It just kind of gets stuck in there. Because the last words of Jesus are, I'm sorry, of David, are, it's chapter 23, but the book doesn't end there. It keeps going. So what I'm going to do this morning is wrap up our study of 2 Samuel, and also which is the study of David. And we will end that, that this morning. So I will look at three conclusions to the story uh, that the author gives us in 2 Samuel. And then part of it is in 1 Kings because David doesn't die until chapter 2 of 1 Kings. So we will look at the three endings for David. 2 Samuel 24 is the first one. Uh, beginning in verse 15. Before I start reading, though, back in verse 1, it says, Now again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and it, it incited David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. Back in verse 1 of 24, the people were arrogant. David was arrogant. Look at us. Look at how large we are, how strong we are. Look at how we conquered the world around us. Look at who we are, the mighty people of Israel, not the mighty people of God. So God is bringing punishment on their arrogance and their pride, and their neglect of giving the glory to God for who they are. And he, he says the punishment is the death angel. And we'll pick up reading in verse 15 in the middle of the story. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And 70,000 men of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented the calamity and said to the angel who destroyed the people it is enough now relax your hands and the angel of the lord was by the threshing floor of aruna the jebusite then david spoke to the lord when he saw the angel who was striking down the people and said behold it is i who have sinned and it is i who have done wrong but these sheep what have they done please let your hand be against me and against my father's house so Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. David went up according to the word of Gad, just as the Lord had commanded. Arunah looked down and saw the king and his servants crossing over toward him. And Arunah went out and bowed his face to the ground before the king. Then Arunah said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord the plague may be held back from the people. Arunah said to David, Let my lord the king take the offer up, take and offer up what is good in his sight. Look, the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. Everything, O king, Arunah gives to the king. And Arunah said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. However, the king said to Arunah, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price, for I will not offer a burnt offering to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor of the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built there an altar of the Lord and offered burnt offering for, and peace offerings. Thus the Lord was removed, was moved by prayer for the land, and the plague was held back from Israel. So the last act of David, that's the end of 2 Samuel, is repentance. And I think what a beautiful picture the author paints of David by ending with his last act being that of repentance. Uh, from the beginning of David's life to the end, we see a man who truly loves God, seeks God, and pursues God, yet he is still man, and he still sins, 
And the last chapter is David's sin of arrogance and pride, but it ends with David's repentance, agreeing with God, acknowledging with it, that God has convicted and pointed out the sin. So his last act is repentance. So the picture in 24 is the whole nation sins, verse 1. The nation is who God is upset with, as well as David, because they all have the pride in the areas within them. And God's desire is to humble both David and the nation for their pride and remind them who they are as God's people, who God is as their Savior and provider. Uh, David repents of his pride in verse 17. He said, it is my sin that has caused this. Now, this is important for me because in verse 1 it says, Now again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Israel had sinned here. It's Israel's pride. And he allows David to go along with the crowd, get caught up in the pride and arrogance, and be prideful also in asking for the census to be taken. When the, David sees the death angel coming, David says, It is Israel's fault this is happening. They did this. They caused this. Go get them, God. That's not what he says. David says the sin, as defined in verse 1 of Israel's sin, David says the sin is mine. It's my error. It's my pride that's caused this. David claims responsibility for what's going on. It was his sin. He was arrogant. But so is everybody else. But why didn't David say, look, you made me this way. I'm only human. I'm just going along with the crowd. David shows to me great character and integrity in saying, in the midst of everybody being sinful, no, God, it's my sin that's caused this. Deal with me and me alone and release the people of this calamity. And to me, that's pretty impressive. Uh, because if ever there's a time to have an excuse, David had one. And he doesn't use it. David claims the responsibility for the sin that has caused what is happening. Uh, that is a great example for you and I as believers, I think, that we are to claim the responsibility for our sin, even if our sin is a group event. If all of us hear sin, when God convicts, I should stand up and say to God, no, this is my sin, not their sin. I'm held accountable to God for me and me alone. So David acknowledges his sin and asks for God's mercy on the people who commit the same sin. I think it's pretty impressive of David to do that. I think very much we can get caught up in a group event of sin, whether it's nationally or in a business or on a team or in a family. Uh, we can become arrogant as a nation, as a business, as a team, as a family. Uh, prideful. We can get involved in sin as large as a national sin, as small as a family sin. Uh, and the, the point being, when God does convict and bring that to light, that he is not happy with us and our actions, we accept responsibility for our actions. Uh, it's very easy for me to grow up in a family that's not real Christ-like and blame the family for my actions and not me. Now, does any of that sound remotely familiar? In our culture, in our society of victims, it's never my fault. It's always somebody else's fault. It's the color of my skin. I cannot be accepted in government employment because I'm a white male, which is very true in many cases. It's easy for me to blame my culture, my community, my family, my business, my team for my sin. And that's not acceptable. David sets the example for us. I am to acknowledge it is my sin, it is my mistake, and I accept responsibility for it. So I will say in, in 2 Samuel chapter 24, David ends really well in the story, repenting of his sin. Well, let me ask you to think about this for a moment. How will you end when the time comes? And we don't know when the time will be. However, I think with current world events, prophecy is being fulfilled as spoken by Jesus in Matthew 24. And by John, Revelation 6, I feel like the horsemen, if you will, in Revelation 6 have gone out or are going out. There is war, there is war, there is death, there is pestilence. Uh, the locust plagues in Africa, the Middle East as far over as Pakistan, which will create famine. Many things are taking place as spoken of by Jesus. Earthquakes in diverse places. Again, Puerto Rico had an earthquake two months ago. When is Puerto Rico have an earthquake? There's no fault line there. That's kind of unique. 
I think things are happening to communicate Christ's return is soon. So my end here is soon. How will I end? If I think I've got three or four more years to go, am I going to do all I can to do enjoy a bunch of the worlds I can before I go? I'm going to buy an F-150, so before I go, I'm going to have my opportunity to drive an F-150. I was telling somebody I had that F-150 for a week last week to go do the work up at the cabin in the mountains. And it's kind of like I enjoyed it for a week. Now Christ can return to take me home. <laughs> I've had my thrill of the truck. Now I can go. I can go to heaven now. It's all been done. But how do I end here? Do I end here focused on myself? Or do I end here focused on others? Trying to be that light for Jesus. Trying to be that salt for Jesus. Trying to be that voice for Christ the world around me. To communicate the need for lost people to accept and experience and know Jesus. Uh, again, I think the end is close. Out of Matthew 24, I think things are happening as Christ said they would happen. He says in the end of that chapter... As the fig tree bears fruit every year in the spring, look for the signs of the times. I think the signs are there. So how are we going to end if, in fact, the end is soon? We want to end as a very bright, shining light for Jesus, for those around us, because they desperately need to see that witness of Christ in us. So the first end to 2 Samuel is chapter 24, and it is David repenting, taking the responsibility for the nation, for the sin, his sin and their sin. The second end comes in 1 Kings, chapters 1 and 2. And this is where David actually dies. And we'll go back to the chapter 23 in a few minutes. So in 1 Kings, David is old. He is weak. Uh, he is pretty much out of circulation, if you will. He's in his room, and he's sick, and he's feeble, and he's having a hard time with life. Adonijah, his son which at this point would be his second oldest son because his firstborn died. Amnon, his third born, born Absalom, has died. Uh, there's one other one that we have no mention of in the text, but the fact that he was born. Adonijah may have been the oldest one at this point, but anyway, he decides that since David is sick and ill and near his death, that he will make himself king. So he declares himself king, uh, has the men run before him and his horses and his chariots, announcing and celebrating him as king. He calls for a party, and he invites everyone to that party except for Nathan, Solomon, ben and I, uh, and Zadok, the priest. He knows who to invite and who not to invite. Uh, no one challenges Adonijah openly. In verse 8 it says, But Zadok, the priest, ben I, the son of Jehoda, Nathan, the prophet, Shammai, Riah, the mighty men who belonged to David, were not with Adonijah. However, no one openly came out and questioned him, claiming to be king. We know, though, that David told Bathsheba when Solomon was born that he would be king. Nathan the prophet is the one who steps up to intervene and to correct what's going on. So chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. I'm not going to read all two chapters, just try and get the, the main point here to focus on the end. Then Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you not heard that Adonijah, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king, and David our Lord does not know it? So now come, please, let me give you counsel and save your life and the life of your son Solomon. Go at once to King David and say to him, Have you not, my lord, O king, sworn to your maidservants, saying, Surely Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then has Adonijah become king. Behold, while you are still there speaking with the king, I will come in after you and confirm your words. So Bathsheba went to the king in the bedroom. Now the king was very old, and Abishag the Shumite was ministering to the king. Then Bathsheba bowed her and prostrated herself before the king, and the king said, Why, what do you wish? She said to him, My lord, you swore to your maidservant by the Lord your God, saying, Surely your son Solomon shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne. <clears throat> now behold, Adonijah is king, and now, my lord, the king, you are not, you do not know it. He has sacrificed oxen and fatlings and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the sons of the king, and Abathar the priest, and Joab the commander of the army, but he has not invited Solomon your servant. As for you now, my lord, the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you, to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise, it will come about as soon as my lord the king sleeps with the father, his fathers, that I and my son Solomon 
will be considered offenders. Behold, while she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet came in. Nathan comes in and says basically the same thing. Let's get down to verse 26. But me, even me, Nathan speaking, your servant and Zadok the priest and Benaiah the son of Jehuda, and your servant Solomon has not, has not, he has not invited. Has the thing been done by my lord the king and you have not known shown to your servants who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Then king David said, Call Bathsheba to me. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. The king vowed and said, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all distress, surely as I vow to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Your son Solomon shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. I will indeed do so this day. Then Bathsheba bowed her face to the ground, and prostrated herself before the king and said, may, the, may my lord, the king David, live forever. Then King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah the son of Jehoda. And they came into the king's presence. The king said to them, Take with you the servants of your lord, and have my son Solomon ride on my own mule, and bring him down to Gehoan. Let Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, anoint him there as king over Israel, and blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne and be king in my place, for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. Benani, the son of Jehoda, answered the king and said, Amen. Thus may the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king, say, As the Lord has been with my Lord, the king, so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. So Solomon is crowned king. Um, Nathan intervenes and God speaks to God, to David through Nathan, and David does what is right in keeping his promise to Bathsheba. David also is doing what God wants him to do. Solomon is God's choice to be king. Uh, so the whole event is very much confusing because as David gets older, he has many, many sons. And they would all be vying to be king. And if the wrong one gets on the throne, then everybody else could be killed and wiped out as competitors. So Solomon is crowned. He sits on David's own mule, and he, and he sits on David's throne as well. So the, the, the kingdom, the people of Israel immediately respond to Solomon and abandon Adonijah as king. David encourages his son Solomon as king. This is interesting to me as well. Verses 1 through 9. Of chapter 2 the first the second, the first Kings as David's time drew to die drew near he charged Solomon's son saying I am going the way of all the earth be strong therefore and show yourself a man keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways to keep his statutes his commandments his ordinances and his testimony according to what is written in the law of Moses that you may succeed in all that you do and whatever and where, whatever and wherever you turn so that the Lord may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. I like David's encouragement to his son, who is now king, before David dies. The first thing he says is, basically, grow up and be a man. Now, I don't think Solomon was a child. I don't think Solomon needed to be told to grow up and be a man. But David did need to encourage him in that context. David is saying, you are now the king. Act like it. Live like it. Be the man that you need to be, that God needs you to be, to sit on this throne and rule over Israel. So the idea of, I simplify it, grow up and be a man, is basically what he's saying, but a little more nicer and more formal. Uh, David is telling Solomon to be the man that is worthy to be the man, the king of Israel, and God's man. And in verse 3 through 4, he tells Solomon how to be king. And it's interesting to me what's most important to be king of Israel. It's not politics. Uh, it's not administration it's not warrior it is walk with God there are many things David could have instructed Solomon on being king he says man up and walk with God 
that's great advice from any dad to any son in any area of life. If you wish to succeed, be the man God created you to be and walk with him. David is telling Solomon to walk with God. How did he do that? He walks with God by keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, his testimonies, according to the law of Moses. So in David's day, you surrender to God by keeping the commandments. You surrender to God by knowing God's commandments and Moses' law and doing your best to walk in them. That's how they communicated their righteousness. Not keeping the law, but knowing it and striving to be what God wants them to be. We're not getting legalistic here. The idea is to know God's word and to live your life accordingly. There's still going to be errors and mistakes, yes. That's why we need Jesus, because there's still going to be sin. But the idea for David and Solomon is know God, know his word, and walk with him. David is defining, in the Hebrew terms, a relationship with God. David is saying to Solomon, be the man God created you to be and have that intimate, personal relationship with him. Walk with him. In the verses 5 through 9, David mentions two people. He mentions Joab and he mentions Shemaiah who cursed David during Absalom's rebellion. And David says, deal with him in your wisdom. Joab's an evil man, deal with him. Shemaiah did evil to me, give him what's due him. He points out two individuals who would cause Solomon the most trouble. Joab and Shemaiah. Shemaiah would question the throne in the name of Saul, and Joab was a murderer and a whack job at this point. Uh, David says, deal with them, because they will cause you harm. And Solomon does in the following chapters. So that is the second ending of David. Uh, we get down to verse 10. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. David dies. The third end of David... You with me? <laughs> We've actually buried him now. But over in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 through 7, now these are the last words of David. So this would possibly be David's last psalm that he writes before he dies. So listen to his words, the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, declares, the man who was raised on high declares, the anointed of God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over me righteously, who rules in the fear of God, is as the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass springs up of the earth through sunshine after rain. Truly is not my house so with God, for he has made an everlasting covenant with me, ordered in all things, and secured for all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not indeed make it clean? But the worthless, every one of them, will be thrust away like thorns because they cannot be taken in hand. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they'll be completely burned with fire in their place. Now the last part is God will bring judgment on the unrighteous. They would acknowledge that in the end. Uh, the middle part, David acknowledges that God spoke to him. What highly interests me in this last words of David is how David defines and describes himself. Uh, in verse 1, the man who was raised on high, that's David, God made him king, raised on high. But then the next statement is what surprised me. When David thinks of himself in the end, his greatest accomplishment, his greatest purpose on life, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. In David's last words, he acknowledges, I think, his greatest contribution to all of humanity. A songwriter. A psalmist. Why would David the king, the warrior, the mighty man of Israel, in his last words, point out the man raised on high, the psalmist of Israel? And again, what was David's greatest contribution to humanity. Nothing he built stands today. No one he conquered matters today. Yes, it's an, it's an historical event that took place. He set the stage for several things leading up to Christ. But by and large, nothing he did physically has any impact on you and I today. His son 
that's led down to Jesus, yes, that's important. But his greatest contribution to you and me is what he wrote. What stands until right now is what he wrote. Well, let's look at some of that. Let's look at some of what they wrote that has an impact. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and they were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate the lip, they wag the head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. You are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have enriched and circled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a, rav as a ravening and roaring lion. Happening and morning light. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joints. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of dirt, of death. My contacts are causing me an issue. Hang on. <laughs> For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers evil have encompassed me, encompassed me. This is the most important part of my contacts moving around in my head. Give me a minute. <laughs> For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And from my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, are not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword. My only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen. You answer me. Do you recognize the psalm as the one who describes in detail the crucifixion of Christ? Mm -hmm. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Recognize Psalm 23? Everybody has heard Psalm 23, it seems like. Any funeral you go to, it's in print, what they hand you. David wrote that, the mighty man of Israel, the warrior. He understands who he is and who God called him to be. One more. Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you, you only have, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. In the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And it continues in the same idea. David wrote songs that we call songs. David wrote words that God gave him to write. He says in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. 
The God of Israel said, the God of Israel spoke to me. David comes right out and says, God spoke to me, the sweet psalmist of Israel. David comes right out and acknowledges God has spoken to me, through me, to the whole world. David's last words. He has realized his greatest contribution is not king of Israel. It's what he wrote. It's what God put in his heart and his mind to write. And his words have encouraged millions, if not billions, since his death. Since he wrote. David ends well. When David dies, he gets to see Solomon crowned as king. He gets to see Solomon sit on his throne as king. God blesses him greatly in the end. But I like David's greatest statement. He acknowledges God spoke through me, the psalmist, to you. When I first started reading about David, I was impressed by the fact that he killed Goliath. He didn't run from anything. He stood in the face of every aspect of life because the battle was the Lord's, and he knew it, and he had no worries. had no concern. He had no fear. God is God. There is no other. And he's got this. And I greatly enjoyed his strength, his boldness, his confidence, all of which was in God, not in himself. But the more you get to know David, you realize he had a very, very big heart for God. And that's who the man is. A man who was after, a man for God's own heart as defined by God's word. So as we end David, learn from him as we can, be encouraged as we can, and move forward. Let's pray. And Father, I thank you for the examples you've given us of all the Old Testament, of men and women who loved you, who served you, who followed you, who did what you put them there to do. And Father, I pray we will be faithful in following you, and hearing you, and acknowledging you, and serving you where you placed us. So Father, as the time grows, I think to a close, you will give us boldness and confidence like David, to stand firm because the battle is yours because you are God there is no other and you put us here to be your light to be your salt to be the people who speak the truth of Jesus Christ to a lost world give us confidence Father and boldness to do that to be that voice to say the truth of who you are Jesus the Son of God our Savior in his name we pray Amen